Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum. This is our mid-month podcast. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here, and we are going to kick it off with a new segment. Uh, so for a mid-month podcast, we're going to do five good minutes of financial planning, and we're going to break this down every other podcast and go over financial planning topics. Uh, the first one is going to be around tax strategy. So we'll jump into that. We'll do some role playing and then we'll end up with our, our last segment, the central bank roundup. So let's jump into it. Kevin, let's talk about our, our new topic, financial planning in regards to tax strategy. Yeah. I think that the big elephant in the room is that there was a tax cut passed during the Trump administration, commonly called the Trump tax cuts, and it expires soon. Uh, a year and a half or so, we really got to get some planning done because at the end of 2025, everybody's tax rate's going up. Uh, there's a lot happening in there. So just as a reminder, uh, some major changes took place. We got a higher standard deduction. Tax rates for everybody went down. The estate tax went down. Uh, mortgage interest changed. The salt caps changed. Uh, corporate taxes actually got cut lower, and those are permanent for some reason, while individuals was temporary. So I think it's very important to talk about stack strategies to reduce that, but even more so over the next couple of years in anticipation of everybody's rates going higher. So just one thing, I would say the top rate goes from 37% to 39.6%. Uh, everybody else is going to go up a few percent as well. So I think it's essential to find ways to defer or reduce your tax burden going forward. Okay, so let's 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 break it down to a couple big ones that's going to affect everyday everyday consumer um, listener, etc. So we got a top top tax rates going up. We knew that was coming. What else do you see out there that's going to catch people off guard when this sun sets at the end of twenty twenty five? Yeah, the big thing is the standard deduction. So if you're not itemizing, and it doesn't make sense for the majority of people to itemize, it's the small percentage, and probably many of our clients do itemize, but uh, right now for 2023, the standard deduction for a couple is $27,700. Once these expire, that deduction goes down to $12,700. So more than cut in half. Um, that's a pretty big drop to have suddenly about $15,000 more included as taxable income. And if you're getting taxed at 20 or 30%, you know, that's a few thousand dollars you're going to be paying. Uh, the second thing would be the, uh, the cap that was placed on the state and local tax deductions, so commonly known as SALT, is capped at $10,000. Uh, once the Trump tax cuts go away, that cap no longer applies, but there's phase outs uh, for people who have like a few hundred thousand dollars, that deduction goes away as well. So there's a lot of things you can do. So the first thing I would say is in 2025, you can use standard deduction and you could wait to pay your property taxes. So if you live in Texas, average 2.7% for your property tax, let's say you're paying $10,000 now. Well, you could stack those tax payments all in the following year. So you typically get your bill sometime in the fall, maybe October, November, and it's due by the end of January of the following year. You could pay it in January of 2026 for the first time and pay the second year, so for 2027, at the end of 2026. And the benefit of that is if that stalt deduction goes away, you're going to get a much higher deduction and it will make a lot more sense to itemize since the standard deduction is going to go from almost 30000 down to 13000 so what else can we be doing? So that's at the end of 2025. Um, what do we start doing now to prepare for, for taxes? You know, what's, well, it depends. What's... Um, so if you're a very wealthy family, state taxes are going to jump. So you need to start getting that exemption now. So if the exemption is going to go down a significant amount after 2025, you need to go ahead and do your tax planning now, complete those gifts, get that out of your estate. That way you're not taxed on otherwise. Uh, if you're somebody that has a mortgage, good news. Uh, you might want to cash out refinance after 2025 because instead of being capped at 750 of principal on qualified debt, it goes back to a million, which is where it used to be uh, before that. And if you had home equity interest, uh, that was 
reduced now, it'll go back to get the first 100,000 of that debt is actually deductible for the interest payments. So, you know, there's a chance for you to suddenly go, oh, wow, my whole picture is going to change of what I should be doing to minimize the amount of taxes and maximize my deductions. You know, I think the the one time sensitive one that you mentioned are estate taxes. So as it sits right now, um, an individual can, their lifetime exemption amount is 10 million. Well, actually it's over 10 million because it, it goes up with inflation. Let's call it 12 million. Um, if, you, if you're married filing jointly, it's 24 million, meaning you have a hundred million dollar estate and you pass away today, 24 million is exempt from estate taxes. The other 76 million is going to the IRS at a rate of 40% over that, over that lifetime exemption amount. When this tax rule sunsets in 20, at the end of 2025, it's going to go back down to 5 million per individual. So married filing jointly, it goes back down to 10 million. Now, many of you listening, you might not, that might not be an issue right now, but it could be an issue down the road. If you have a, have a couple million dollars saved up in a 401k or any other investment accounts, as that continues to grow, it's going to be subject to estate taxes down the road. And that's probably not going to be going down. It's probably only going to be going up those, those taxes. So what Kevin is saying is you can start to gift those assets away now because it's going to go back down to that uh, $5 million level per individual. So if you have room left, it's better to give that now in the event that it does drop back down. Um, so I think that if, if you if you fall in that category, you need to start planning sooner than later before this expires. I think that's the biggest time sensitive tax issue I see coming up in the next in the next two years. Yeah, I think that's the biggest hanging fruit out there is to go get that one and make sure you complete those gifts now. And you can still have control of those gifts if you plan it in a uh, very thoughtful way. You're not just giving away the money directly. And so you can give it to a trust and then maybe they inherit it a little bit later. But it's got to be a completed gift to your estate. And that way you get that. Um, I mean, that's it's it's also, you know, Tom, who's in charge at the time of these expirations is probably going to have a big impact on which parts of this get extended and which parts of these just expire. So depending on who's in charge of Congress, you could see certain tax brackets get hit a lot harder than others. You could see certain credits get increased or decreased. Um, so it's a, it's a moving target for sure. But based on today's rules, I think number one is the estate tax, but just planning out your debt when it comes to mortgage and deductions and then planning out your itemized deductions. So if you're gonna make a big charitable gift, does it make sense to do it in 24, 25, or wait until 26 when tax rates are higher so you maximize deduction now? So this is something Tom can help you with and the other advisors at Global Wealth. Yep. Nope. I uh, I agree. So we'll, uh, we'll we'll touch more on some different tax strategies um, as we as we get closer. Um, but I think that's a good I think that's a good start and. You know, for those of you that want more information or have more questions, just you can shoot us an shoot us an email at info at gwadvisors.net um, because there's a lot in the proposal and there's a lot that's going to, you know, possibly expire within the next uh, two years. So we want to make sure we're preparing now for that um, so we're not caught off guard when that does happen. All right. Just get ready for some role play. All right, Tom, you want to go first or second? Uh, I, I'll go first. All right. Uh, so, Tom, you are Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America. Uh, you just failed the stress test for the Fed, but then said, well, it was just a discrepancy. We didn't really fail, but it caused you to delay a dividend while all the other major banks did not have to do a delay. What went wrong? Well, one, I don't know if that's 100% accurate. Uh, the Fed said that they did have enough capital um, to be solvent, but there are some discrepancies on their, I guess, balance sheet or their, their reporting. So I, I don't know. I don't know what went wrong. I, I, would, uh, I would argue that, that we're okay. Um, I would also argue that, you know, cutting the dividend, there's – there's a lot of uncertainty for the banks right now. There's a lot of headwind. You have an inverted yield curve. They're not making nearly as much money as they as they were. And if I'm a big bank, I want to have some dry powder on hand to acquire some smaller ones as others start to uh, pop up insolvent, in my opinion. So I don't know if anything, I don't think there's too much to worry about insolvency right now um, with the big banks, is even with that with that stress test, I think it's more of a strategic play by cutting that dividend. 
Do you think that the uh, unrealized losses on the bond portfolio are a problem, or Fed's just going to bail you out of those? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, that's that's their <laughs> get bailed out <laughs> for sure. There's no way that there's no way they bailed us out in two thousand eight, and now they're not going to bail us out now. They just bailed out a couple of regionals. Um, we're we're in, we're in a good spot. Yeah, you're number one. So that fifty two billion dollar loss, they'll just go ahead and put that on the Fed balance sheet instead of yours. That sounds just, great. Just just an IOU. Just moving from one column to the next. <laughs> All right, Kevin. So you are Jose Garcia, uh, CFO of Standard. You just paid a Santander, 200- sir. Santander. <laughs> you just paid a two hundred twenty-four million euros in a windfall profit tax. Yeah, Tom. I, I got to tell you, these uh, socialists who run our government over here in Spain—they're out of control. They—they're just singling us out. We're—we're we're one industry. There's so many industries that Spain has to offer. There's all these other industries, but yet they only come after us, the banks. We are doing our best. We had losses as previously. Now we're growing, got 10% growth in our profits, and they just take it from us. They paid 224 million euros. For what? For doing the right thing and running our bank properly? What, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I just want to. I just want fair play. I, I'll pay my taxes, but make make everybody else's industry. What, what about all these uh, other industries? They don't pay any windfall taxes. Why is it just the banks? What do we do wrong? Well, what about the oil and gas companies? They're paying their fair share, aren't they? Okay, so two out of twelve industries. What about the other ten? Where, where, where's their windfall profit tax? <laughs> well, listen, I'm we taking this to it. court, to the highest court of Spain, and we're going to get this thing overturned. <laughs> All right. All right, Tom, you're Jerome Powell, chair of the Federal Reserve. Uh, was this a pause, actually a stop? Are you done raising rates? Is the dollar going to fall now that you're done raising rates? Uh, what do we expect from you next? Uh, I am going to continue to raise rates. I've gotten it wrong the whole entire time on the way up. I'm going <laughs> to get it wrong the whole entire way on the way down. Uh, there is... There's no reason for me to pause right now. You have the markets almost hitting it a new all-time high, or at least a 52-week high. You have unemployment still well below where I want to see it. You have inflation way too elevated, in particular core inflation. There's only one way to stop this. Everyone obviously knows that raising rates does stop inflation, and and, and it will cause a soft landing. So I'm going to continue to hike rates at least two to three more times this year. Everyone thinks I'm going to pause, and that's just not going to be the case. I look forward to seeing you thread the needle. <laughs> All right, Kevin. So you're up. You are Mike Decker. Um, who is Mike Decker? Uh, I'm the vice president of the AICPA. You never heard of me? Oh, well, I guess I guess I have now. Only <laughs> sixty-seven thousand people took CPA exams last year, down from seventy-two thousand in twenty-one, and below your own forecast. The numbers are trending towards twenty percent lower. Uh, in the past decade, what is happening in the accounting world and why does no one want to be a CPA? Well, Tom, it's actually a pretty simple math question. It's a little concept called ROI, return on investment. And it turns out that we don't pay that well in accounting compared to technology or finance jobs. And so a lot of the smart kids who could pass our exams are just choosing a different career. They want to make more money and those salaries are inflated over there, but they're coming back. They're going to have to come back. Uh, accounting is the backbone of finance. It's the backbone of the economy. Without accountants, you know, we wouldn't know what the numbers are. We wouldn't be able to make any decisions. Uh, we think that, you know, th- things will be okay. And plus, with this uh, AI GPT, uh, it's going to be fine because, you know, we'll automate some things and, you know, we they have to understand accounting is very important. It's not a crisis. We're going to be fine. It doesn't matter that there's only 80% as many CPAs taking the test as there were a decade ago. Uh, It doesn't matter that the profession plunged to the lowest level of people entering it in the last 17 years. Uh, We're important. We're going to be here. uh, And it's going to, it's going to, it's going to bounce back. It's going to be fine. This is, this is just demographics. This is fine. Yeah, I disagree. I don't think you guys are that all that <laughs> all that useful, to be honest with you. Unless you're doing creative accounting, which uh, those, those creative accounts are all in jail, Tom. The creative accounting, well, the one the good ones aren't. They're the ones that don't get caught on the corporate <laughs> side. Might 
might do well, but the, everything else is automated. So I don't, I don't know. I think TurboTax is doing is doing just fine with uh, with most returns, but we'll see. All right, let's uh, let's move on to our last segment, Central Bank Roundup. Shine those boots. It's time for Ooh, Central Bank Roundup. All right, we kick it off with the uh, the Bank of Germany, uh, known as Bundesbank. Uh, it took a billion dollar hit from its bond holdings. It is <laughs> struggling the same way Bank of America and all the other banks are. They're sitting there holding the bag as interest rates rise on a bunch of bonds that are suddenly worth a lot less. Uh, I mean, I, the ECB going to have to bail them out, Tom? I, I don't know what they're going to do here. This is uh, this is just kind of funny, right? You know, the people the, in charge are causing losses, and it, it was it, they bought 666 billion euros of German government debt last year. And they have losses on all of it because interest rates rose. And you kind of just go, well, yeah, of course they did. Yeah, well, they they all shot themselves in in their own foot. I mean, they, they you had fifteen years of zero interest rates, uh, and you had a ton, a ton of debt issuance. And then my my the biggest catalyst I saw years ago for why rates will not go as high as they are right now. I never thought they would even get as high as they are right now is, is for that very reason alone is that these central banks would put themselves into bankruptcy if they raise rates too much just because the interest carry alone on this debt should do that. But I also forgot that, you know, they have a blank checkbook and will just continue to bail themselves out. What else are they going to do? Default. So they write they, IOUs. That's how they, they do it. Um, they, they, so they write they, IOUs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so they did this in the 70s and they said that they basically were like look these losses this is temporary this will go away we'll just deduct it against future profits 10 or 15 years from now so they still have 170 billion of gold and foreign exchange reserves and then they said they'd carry the losses forward what's funny is that in berlin they have the same thing going on as in the u.s so the treasury department for the last few years has basically got uh, i don't know i don't want to call it interest payments but they've gotten money they didn't earn from the Fed saying, hey, we had profits this year and they give it back to the Treasury. Well, because of the losses they're having now, they're not going to give that to the Treasury. So the Treasury is going to have to be funded some other way or cut its expenses. So are they going to have fiscal reform? Are they going to go get more fines? Uh, it's just funny to see it happening somewhere else, which is Germany's got the exact same thing. It's supposed to be a much more disciplined you know, central bank, supposedly better <laughs> leaders than the US. And they had the same problem we have. And it's all from rising rates. Yeah, I don't think it's going to get any better anytime soon. And I don't even think it really has even trickled into the economy yet because of how quickly they've gone up. So the big question that you know we were joking about earlier, I mean, does he continue to, to raise rates? I don't even think that's relevant at this point because if he does, it might be one or two more times. It's how long does he keep those rates elevated for? If this, yeah. if we're, if we fast forward twelve months and we're still at where we're at right now, over five percent on the Fed funds rate, it's going to be. I think it's going to be bad, and it's going to get. It will get bad, and then they'll hopefully, well, they'll have no choice but to lower rates. Um, but yeah, it's. I, there's a lot of countries I think that are that are in the same. We have a global debt problem right now, so, global sovereign debt problem. Remember, three years ago there was 17 trillion dollars in sovereign debt with negative yields, negative yields. Now you got interest rates that are not only not negative but they're up, they're up five uh, percent. <laughs> I mean, it's it's yeah. crazy to think about how quickly that reversed. That we were just talking about negative sovereign debt yields only three three and a half years ago, and it was seventeen trillion around the world. Now everyone is up, you know, five thousand basis points from then. Yeah, a lot of these are paper losses, just like the banks. So we'll see what happens. Um, so the next one is the uh, question of dollar dominance. So central banks we've talked about in previous episodes for the past year have been the major driver for buying gold. They've all been trying to diverse away from the dollar. Well, thankfully, somebody did a survey and asked all the central bankers what they plan to do next. So today, as we mentioned before, 58% of the foreign reserves held at other central banks are U.S. dollars. Uh, that number is down from 70% where it was 20 years ago. But they said their expectations going forward is in 10 years, so 2033, they expect it still to be 54%. So even though it's smaller than it used to be, 54% of all foreign exchange reserves are going to be held in U.S. dollars. Uh, I don't think it's going anywhere, right? 
No, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think it is either. I mean, where else is it? Where else is going to go? I mean, this has been going on for 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 years. Um, I don't think it's. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think the dollar has has peaked out. I mean, you saw how you saw the run run up last year, which was a big reason. You know, we talked about before, between the inverse correlation between the, the the stock market and the dollar, and that has decoupled a little bit, and the dollar has kind of just somewhat flatlined uh, since the beginning of the year. So I don't see, I don't see much movement, nor do I see it losing its, its, its dominance unless, like I've said before, the U S just starts to default on its debt. Um, and hey, we it, almost it, did two months ago. It, 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 and we could, we could, I mean, that, that, that amount just keeps, just keeps growing and it's going to continue. It's like pouring gasoline on the fire when now you have interest rates at 5% versus zero and you have to pay that interest somehow. It's just going to keep mounting and mounting. Um, couple that with stuck, like, well, yes, go ahead. No, I was gonna, and couple that with just demographics. People are living longer. You have social security, Medicare, Medicaid. I mean, that's some of the biggest contributors to our, to our, our social plans and our debt. Um, it's everything is, I don't see how we get out of this debt issue. Um, and that should, like any other company that's insolvent or has a lot of debt, um, starts to get downgraded. And that's the only way, in my opinion, that the, the dollar uses its dominance is if we start to get downgraded. But then again, if we're getting downgraded, who's what other currency is going to step in? I don't know. Yeah, well, that's a good point to kind of finish on, which is the study also found only 13% of respondents said they expected to increase their holdings of Chinese currency. Um, so that's down from last year where it was 30%. You know, they, they go from a really small number. They're only 3% of reserves right now. So if they got to, you know, four or five or six, that's a considerable amount more. But if 10 years from now, the Chinese currency makes up 6% of foreign reserves and the U.S. is 54%, and the euro is 20%, and then gold and other hodgepodge and stuff makes up the rest, the U.S. is still going to be kind of the only game in town, or at least the most dominant player in town. Yeah, no, I, American. I agree. We're the uh, cleanest shirt in a basket of dirty laundry. <laughs> um, All right. Well, uh, let's go stay in Asia, uh, sort of, as we finish with Japan. The uh, Bank of Japan is getting pretty close to a spot where they previously intervened in their currency against the dollar. So the end of kind of 2022, October around then, they did a currency intervention to fix it. And they went from 150 per dollar back to 130 through that intervention. And that worked for a while, uh, but now it's trending back to the mid 140s on yen to dollars. I, I think if it gets back to 150, they've kind of made it clear that 144, 147, that's where they start to get involved. Uh, if it goes past 150, I think they have to do something, right? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I don't think they'll let it get past past 150. They haven't. I don't think they they will. I mean, they've been keeping their interest rates in a very, very tight range for a very, very long time, and they're going to do. They're going to continue to do that with their with their currency. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they did they, like so. October of last year it was interesting about that. It was kind of the peak in rates. Uh, for a little while and it was kind of the bottom of the markets and i think a lot of it was they dumped 65 billion dollars of foreign reserves just on the market to defend the yen and so if they do that again maybe you get another leg up in the rest of the markets here yeah i mean it peaked out in what uh looks like it was october of, of last year um got right up mm -hmm. to that one, 150 so uh yeah it'll be interesting to, to it'll be interesting to see what these central banks all all do um you know, it's almost like a game of chicken. Who's going to be the first one to to stop or actually even cut rates? Um, I don't think. I think. I think they're all waiting for someone else to, to do it and see the impact that it has. It's just yeah. like the, it, <laughs> well, they were all doing the Fed, and then the Fed stopped, and now the ECB says they're going to keep going, and then the Bank of England is in the worst spot. They have allegedly, based on their commentators, no credibility, and they're going to have to raise rates. At least the Fed has some credibility that they might do it. To where they're threatening and their job owning has an effect. The Bank of England has no effect with their job owning, and so they have to raise rates because their job owning just doesn't work. Yeah, and you know what? I think the job owning here is becoming less and less impactful. I think the market has kind of grown callous to it. Um, I mean, the fact that 
we went just it was just in march right before this whole the whole regional bank debacle um we were they were saying not only are they not raising but they're going to cut two to even three times four years in and now we're talking about nope it was just a pause and we're going to raise possibly two more times and the market keeps going up you know this time last year you know the market never reacts twice on the same news and this is old mm-hmm. news raising rates so that's why i said i think it's almost irrelevant them raising rates it's just how long do they keep it there before I, how much destruction do they really really want to see um and it's not helping us if and when i say us those in, in the camp that don't want them to raise rates with the market just continuing to to go higher and higher i mean the fed whatever they say and do the, the market is just is just ignoring it, um, which you haven't seen that in a while, in my opinion. Well, I think they think that the, the battle's over and we're on to what they call the last mile or the end game, right? Which is part of the reason they pause to say, look, inflation went from eight, now it's down to six, now it's down to four, if we can just get a little bit lower. So we've kind of talked before of whether or not they're just going to declare victory when they get to three or four and say, ah, oh, that's good enough, or if they're going to really push for that last mile to get under two. And I do think it'll take a little bit more in the absence of fiscal changes, um, you know, unless you cut government spending by a significant amount to cut the inflation rate that way, uh, they're going to have to keep rates higher a little bit longer. But I'll be curious to see when they get to that too, do they just pause or do they cut immediately? Okay, now growth's weak. We need to get that going, even though we saw the inflation. So, well, well uh, you know, it'll like, be a good show. <laughs> no, Jeff, Jeff Gunlack said it best. He's like, what are these... What world do they think that inflation is just going to magically stop at two percent? He goes, if it's going to continue to drop, what's it to not to, to, to drop right to zero? They're not just going to be able to stop it right at two percent. Uh, and and I agree with them. And why is even two percent the the number? And we've talked about this before. So, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't think they have the, they. Well, I know they don't have answers to any of those questions. Uh, they, they, they well, don't. the short answer is they want a little bit of inflation. I don't. I think two is arbitrary. They just want something more than zero. And the reason why is it kind of greases the skids of economic growth. Because if you and I go into a deflationary world and every day products get a little cheaper, well, you're just going to keep waiting to buy and waiting to buy. So if they can get just a tiny little bit of inflation to where, man, I got to buy that product because it's going to be 1% more expensive or 2% more expensive a year from now, that kind of forces you into action versus, you know, now or what we told the last year, which is, you know, prices doubling in some places at the grocery store and really kind of going up eight, 10, 20% over two years, uh, that's a big problem. But if you go, ah, it goes up a little bit, it kind of greases the wheels. But deflation is something I think all central bankers have decided we will not let that happen. So to answer you and Jeff Gunlack, they're gonna cut rates and do quantitative easing and anything they can to prevent deflation. So I think it is really hard to say, we're gonna keep it between zero and two, but they just want the tiniest little bit to motivate you to go buy. Ask these guys how well that worked out for them from 2010, 2020. It didn't. It, it, they couldn't, you couldn't create inflation anywhere. That's my, my point being, it's like they, they don't have the right tool. I don't, no one knows what the right tool is, but it's, they're just not going to be able to stop it at 2%. Um, it's probably going to go really, really low and it's going to become deflationary. And then we're going to be in the same position we were 10 years ago. In my in my opinion, yeah. but I, yeah, I, I think that that's the the kind of one to end on is we get to find out if this is just a political thing because there is an election next year, and I think there's a lot of pressure on the Fed as well as most people who are incumbents in Congress to let's just keep this thing going a little bit longer. Let's not have it collapse until after November of 2024. Then if they all get reelected and everybody gets their terms again, okay, well now we'll let it go because we got two years until the next election or four years in some cases. So well, it's, uh, or six years if you're a senator, which is nice, but none yeah. of them want to be in the front of a election going into an economic disaster or a major recession. So I do think they're doing everything they can to just, let's just keep this thing on life support a little bit longer so we don't all get fired. Well, I agree with you, and I, I think we'll end on this. We just got some breaking news from Nikki T. Just tweeted uh, that uh, Kansas City Fed President George, uh, she thinks that for the Fed to pivot, it's going to have to get closer to three percent than four and a half percent. Which I should say that's not breaking news. That's what they've that's what they've been saying. But breaking tweets about that. They're they're being very aggressive. They're almost talking too much. Where now it's just I don't think it's working. I don't. I really. Well, don't. They, they all started to say different things. Yeah. So that's the issue. Which just just I proves that they have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> well, that's why it's so hard to predict. They don't know what they're going to do, so we can't predict what they're going to do because there's nothing to read into it. It's not like 
Yeah, it's not predicting sports scores. You go, oh, I like see this advantage here, and this team's a little better. They don't have any idea what they're going to do, right? So it's oh, crazy. All right. Well, with that, uh, we'll end it there. We'll continue. Uh, we'll continue our tax talk um, in in a couple of weeks on our mid or our next mid month podcast. We'll come with some strategies and some. We get a lot of questions from clients, and they're very similar. Everyone's got the same questions as it relates to taxes. So we'll come with some ideas and some strategies, and then the next podcast will be our, our end of the month. So with that, thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.